is the biblical exodus. The exodus found in the Bible, the biblical exodus, is the biblical exodus anti-African. <laughs> yes, brothers and sisters, yes, we're on this one again. Yeah, is the biblical exodus, is the exodus anti-African. That's to say, I guess, anti-black people. Is the biblical exodus the narrative that we find in the Bible, especially the second book of the Bible, the second book of the Torah, in Exodus, also known as the Sefer HaShemot, the Yetziat, the Yetziat uh, Mitzrayim, the Mitzrayim, the Exodus from Egypt, is the Exodus, the Exodus, is it anti-African? Very interesting discussion. We got to hear a portion of it from um, had the elder, elder Yara, Yara um, give thanks and heal up. Uh, shalom, shalom, uh, shalom, lak. Leka, you know, shalom to the elder right there. He had a very good opening, and also to um the comedic um, aka brother Jabari as well. You know, he's on the side that yes, the Exodus, the biblical Exodus, is anti-African or anti-comedic at least or anti-black people. From what I heard, he was he was grasping a little bit right there. But this is um a familiar um refrain of um many of the pro-black call them pro-black face, but many of the pro-black um, comedic scholars and presenters and different ones and ones, especially like on the Sarnetta platform, on the House of Conscience platform. So it's interesting, this has been going on for a moment and some very interesting discussions, um, pro and 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 anti. <laughs> but this one right here, 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 we would say that the, the biblical narrative, actually the Bible is more pro um, quote African or pro-black people if we would look at it first of all in the proper context now even why this particular book has been used by so many others especially the so-called white people you know the so-called white Christians and Jews you know they have used yes they have used and abused the narrative here the cover up is worse than the lie and they've sought to cover it up and now with the awakening of the Beta Israel, so this is Beta Israel in the West, the awakening of the once lost, now found, black and brown people, the sheeple of the Beit Yisrael, this particular point now is a very important point to address. How do we look at this narrative here? As we said, that brother, um, Elder Yara, he had a very good opening, how he presented it. First of all, getting a definition of, okay, what is anti African. What do we mean by anti-African? Now, those of y'all who know that we have addressed this particular subject matter know that we have questioned the whole thing about African, quote, unquote. What is African? What do you mean when you say African? And what do they mean when they say African? Because African is a latter-day terminology that has been superimposed on us as many other terminologies and ideas, even if we would connect with the curse of so-called the pseudo curse of ham. And Jabari even mentioned that briefly, you know, that there's a lot of discussion about whether it was really even like a curse of ham. And, you know, so that means that either he's listening to or he's heard directly or indirectly some of what we of the LOJ, the line of Judah, Society of His Majesty have put forward or perhaps a video here or there or others who also share the same perspective based on the, the evidence. So let's just address this as kind of succinctly as possible, right? And also to return to, you know, the listening of the, the, the debate that is going on between Elder um, Ira and um, Brother Jabari on this very same subject matter. Is the biblical exodus anti-African? First of all, definition of terms is very important. That's where Elder Yara, he started out with that definition of terms, right? So who really is anti-African? <laughs> now here we have a bunch of, um, I think, um, Gentiles, whites, maybe some some um, Latter-day Arabs, Arabic, you know, you know, people. I say hybrid because it's a, if you know the history of ancient Egypt and all the different, you know, conquerors that had you know, conquered or invaders that had conquered and subdued and brought down ancient Kemet. It was not the Hebrews, right? You don't see the Hebrews doing these things, digging up the bodies and, and exhuming the bodies and, and, and violating the, the final resting places of um, the, you know, the Kemetic ancestors. You know what I mean? So who really is anti? We regard that so-called Egyptology actually is anti-African. You know, who's anti-African is the Egyptologists who are anti-Africans. I mean, how they have disturbed the grave sites 
you know. And in a sense, it seems like some of the comedic scholars and pro comedics they 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 it, it seems like they have blinders on about this. They know that it's happened, but it's not as important as harping on us as Hebrews and Israelites, and even as Black Jews, you know, especially us of the Lion of the Tribe of Judah, and saying that well, the biblical Exodus narrative is actually anti-Black, it's anti-African. They're grasping, right? They're grasping. All right. Now, yes, it can be seen that way, but there's a lot of other important points concerning ancient Egypt that we would expect the Kemetic scholars to be speaking about, such as the fake Egyptology. There's a lot of fake Egyptology. So what can we really discern? Some even say that the biblical narrative exodus did not happen. They say, well, it absolutely did not happen. Others say that, well, the, the Bible is plagiarized from ancient Egypt. Well, if it's plagiarized from ancient Egypt, as Elder Yara made this very, very important point, then how could it be anti-so-called comedic or anti-African? In other words, if the Hebrews, the Israelites, the, we said the black Jews, but more correctly according to the narrative, then the Hebrews and the Bnei Yisrael, if they were anti-comedic or anti-Egypt or anti-Mitzrayim or anti-African, and then they plagiarize you know, and Egypt, you know, in this scripture. So basically what we're reading, according to some comedics, what we're reading in the Bible is really plagiarized, you know, Egyptology or comedic science or whatnot. So how are they anti? It was a very, very good point that Elder Yara made. But these are some of the other areas that, you know, ask your comedic scholars or presenters or the, the brother Jabari, uh, let's address this right here. I'm sure that we're probably going to see something on Sarnetta pretty soon or maybe Jabari to address this right here on the fake you know, the fake Egyptology, because see, the fake Egyptology means that if there's fake Egyptology, that means they're not showing us the real Egyptology. That means that the real evidence of the exodus of the Hebrews and the Israelites might be covered up. Well, we know it's being covered up. We know that there's so much archaeology that is still left, you know, in underground or back rooms of their museums, and they've even acknowledged the same. So that means they're holding back the true, the real Egyptology. And this cuts on through a lot of points, even points that many of the pro comedic scholars like Jabari and and like um, who the Leonard Jeffries and others who are seeking to have something going on out there in Egypt to discuss, you know, the African or the black, you know, connection with ancient Egypt and the um, latter day um, so-called Egyptians, you know. Um, I say there's a lot of racism amongst them, like the Dr. Zahi, Zawi, Zahi, Hawass, that, that guy and everybody else, so forth and so on. But that's a whole other related point. This is a point just to be made concerning even viewing, you know, the basic context of the point. The basic context of the point has to be put into also Egypt, ancient Egypt. Who is anti-African, anti-black, anti-Kemetic? It's actually Egyptology, right? It's the Egyptology, right? And who is putting out disinformation, right? So a lot of the things that we're arguing about whether it really occurred and if it did occur, how come there's nothing written, you know, on the wall paintings and the monuments is as though we are seeing everything. We're not even seeing everything. We're only being allowed a particular narrative. There's a certain narrative that the Egyptologist has put out and the so-called pro-black comedic has to work within the available right evidence or information and a lot of the information and evidence from ancient Egypt is actually disinformation that's being given out the basic information right that's being given out a great majority of it is disinformation for example when we start to talk about well let's talk about the exodus the time period of the exodus second book of Moshe second book of Moses well who was the daughter of Pharaoh Pharaoh's daughter it says that Moshe became the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So which one? So many of us had believed that the one on the right-hand side was the actual Egyptology. As we go a little further, some say that this is not really a she, but actually a he. But then we go a little bit further and we find out that it's actually a fake. So on the left-hand side, it's supposed to be Hatshepsut, right? Hatshepsut. On the right-hand side, right, is the Hatshepsut statue that they put forward all right so is this real which one is real which one is fake all right we say the time period of moshe and the exodus occurring 
circa the so-called 18th dynasty, the period of the Hebrews from even the period of time of Joseph in Mitzrayim or in Egypt from the 12th dynasty, ancient Egypt, right, roughly to the 18th dynasty. When we say roughly, we're saying that because there's a lot of question about the chronology. The chronology has not been really stabilized. Anybody who studied ancient Egyptology knows this for themselves. Others might not know this, but you need to get to know this. And whenever they try to really work it out, they use the Bible. So the Bible is used by the ancient, you know, so-called Egyptologists or the Egyptologists into ancient Egypt, right, to help them and assist them. We've already said it on the record that if it wasn't for the Bible, Egyptology would not really even exist today if it wasn't for the Bible. There would be no Egyptology. There would not even be this sort of interest, right? So in a sense, the whole point about anti-African, anti-Egypt, we can say is the Bible, even the Exodus, pro-black, pro-African, right? Because of its focus, right, on ancient Egypt, ancient black peoples, right? And there's many different black peoples. Right, we can actually flip around this particular question here based on the available evidence, archaeology, you know, and ask the question of um, is or was ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, anti-black? Was it anti-Negro? Was ancient Egypt anti-Negro? Was ancient Egypt anti-black? Now, some would say, how can that be? Those of y'all who accept the fact that, yes, ancient Egypt is black and always do have black people there. But according to the present narrative of races, we start to look at it. It seems as though whenever we see dark skinned black people, so-called Nubians or Tanesi or whatnot, they are always, you know, bending their knee and serving, you know, or they are bound up in captivity or we find them on the bottom of King Tut's shoes. Have you ever seen that? I don't know if any of you have seen that on the bottom of King Tut shoes, right? <laughs> you know, on the bottom of King Tut shoes. And also, you know, the Nubians, you know, getting eaten up by the pharaohs, um, dogs and, and, and beasts, and also getting run over by the chariots. We see this a whole lot. It just seems to be that way. Maybe the Egyptians, you know, being a little reddish, brown, a little I won't say lighter skin, but a little redder, redder and browner complexion to the dark skin, so-called Negroes of the South. It seems as though there was some colorism. Was there some colorism going on? Why can we show you them abusing, right, or bringing into captivity, right, or killing them, speaking about black Negro people? And this is a point that a lot of the so-called... I would say racist <laughs> or pro-white people, pro-white Egypt people, they often use these particular points. And it seems as though the pro-black comedics kind of, you know, they'll battle it a little bit on some of the blog pages and other places, but they don't really go into it much outside of that, you know? So it's a point that the so-called pro-white Egypt people, including the modern, you know, white so-called Egyptians today, it's a point that they utilize. And I would expect ones like Jabari and others to, you know, take on those particular points. But you get stuck. Man, them get stuck on this whole Egypt point with we, you know, black Hebrews and Israelites, right? But don't really challenge the points concerning what they are defending. They don't really properly defend against the real enemies of what they say is theirs. So here we have Tutmos, right? Tutmos the third. Now, many of us for a little bit of time have been laboring under, when we, when we get into ancient Egypt and ancient Egyptology, we have to accept that sometimes we'll be laboring under, you know, under delusions or illusions. What do I mean by that? You know, that, for example, on the right hand side, the one that has fraud underneath it, that's um, the statue that is presented to be King Tut, not King Tut, uh, King Tutmos, King Tutmos, right? Tutmos the third. That is alleged to be Tutmosis, his image. But then on the right hand, it's said to be the actual image of the one we regard to be the pharaoh of the Exodus, Tutmos the third. So we have to ask this question, right? Who's who? Right. Is this really a fraud? Right. And we're not the experts, you know, in the comedic research. I mean, we do have our expertise, but there are other ones who are. This is what they do. 
you know, like the, the, the brother Jabari's and the rest of them. This is just not even a point, like a gotcha point or nothing like that. It's basically to say that even when we as Hebrews and Israelites are researching and we get to a certain point, we find there's a lot of fraud, a lot of fraudulent disinformation coming out of Egyptology from ancient Egypt. And then when we get into discussions with, you know, black brothers and sisters who promote, you know, who are pro-Kemetic and pro-ancient Egypt, we find that they are regurgitating you know, the, the disinformation and the questionable information, disinformation and questionable information from the Egyptologists. And they are never confronting the Egyptologists on this or even correcting it or even answering to us, for example, is this King Tut? I mean, King Tutmosis? <laughs> We're going to get to the King Tut shoes for a moment because the question is about whether the Exodus, right, is anti, right, African. Right? The exodus is not anti-so-called African or anti-black. We could say the exodus is anti-downpression, anti-oppression, right? whether black or white, right? whether black or white. That's why we're making this point concerning whether ancient Kemet, right? the ancient Mitzrayim, was anti-black. Were they anti-black? Were they anti-dark skin? People. Now, some could point out a couple of statues here or there. You know, like, for example, in King Tut's tomb, there's a, a black statue and totally black, right? With some gold, you know, gold trimming, gold highlights. So it's a, a, a perfect contrast, a beautiful, beautiful statue. People say, well, this is actually Osiris or this is the guardian of, you know, King Tut in his tomb, so forth and so on. You know, but then in the same tomb, we find some other interesting things that often are not are not emphasized, not highlighted, not focused upon. But first, before we get to that, let's talk about some of the, the, the fakery in Egyptology, right? Europeans have stolen ancient black history and made it theirs, right? So who's really anti-African, anti-black, right? This is a bus of Nefertiti that has been proved to be an Egyptology fraud created by an artist commissioned by Ludwig um, Borkart, Right. It was deliberate, a deliberate attempt to make her look European, right? Or like a white, I guess a white woman, white European. These are the genuine ancient Egyptians renderings of Nefertiti. You see over here her African features, right? Her body, right? Yeah, wow. It's interesting that profile right there. <laughs> right? Her body, right? Um you know, the junk in the trunk, as they would say today, right? And her color, right? A lot of this, if you look at it today, they are already manipulating these things. They're redoing these things. CGIF is really giving them a lot of interesting technology to do a lot of things right now. And we don't hear the pro comedics speaking about this, raising the law, bringing the alarm on this. Instead of going back over and over as to whether the exodus was anti African, anti-black. We could say that yes, yes, yes it was. Especially with the killing of the male children, the, the Hebrew male children, right? It was genocidal, right? In, infanticide, they, they call it infanticide, according to the same biblical narrative. Once again, the fake, right, Nefertiti and the authentic Nefertiti. Where's the discussion about this? It's interesting, the other day I was watching a video about revelation of the pyramids in ancient Egypt. I'll get the exact name. And in that, they had some experts. The woman or one of the ones who did this documentary, they had some experts. And one expert was in this room and was talking about ancient Egypt and, and so forth and so on. And in the back, behind this particular ex um, expert, was all of these like busts right, of Nefertiti. And I remember looking past the, the person being interviewed and speaking and seeing all these different busts. It was almost like this is where they do all this fake stuff. You know what I mean? And I said, why does this person have all these different busts? Maybe they're like recreations and they just saw a, a Nefertiti um, aficionado or something like that. You know, but it was very strange in light of the authentic and the fakery that is going on with Egyptology. Right? And this is a little bit more on this right here. Right? So we point this out because how can we trust the evidence that we have from ancient Egypt, right? Okay, now this is going off on something different. We're going to have to pause for a cause. For example, for example, right here, 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 
is this um, anti-black? Is this anti-dark skin? We could make the argument was an ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet anti-dark skin, except with some, they had some exceptions to the rule, you know, because people are going to point to a few pharaohs or a few ones or some paintings and everything who are dark skin and even some who are Kushite or from the South, so forth and so on. That all occurred according to the Egyptologists later on, you know, the so-called Nubian you know, or the black pharaohs. You saw that um, magazine cover where they saw that there was black pharaohs. You know, look, there was black pharaohs. Oh, wait, hold on for a moment. I thought ancient Egypt was black. <laughs> if ancient Egypt was black and now you're celebrating a few black pharaohs, uh-oh, what's going on here? If ancient Egypt was black, how can you then be telling me, oh, look, here's some black pharaohs. I thought in that case, it should be, here are the pharaohs and look they all black but now you're showing me a selection of a few who are quote black pharaohs they are special they are exceptions to the rule they are Cushitic. they are coming from the south they are nubians even if we want to go into narrative and say well actually it was all established from ethiopia from tobia from inner africa from the very beginning in ancient egypt mitzrayim was a colony of kush so forth and so on and it broke off and it became its own something but then later on and like after thousands of years when things started to go go sideways right to restore things to restore ancient egypt the uh, Kushites and the original the descendants of the original we could say um, progenitors of ancient Egypt they had to come into the picture and had to kind of like revitalize ancient Egypt there's that narrative they'll give us right but let's hold up for a moment on that let's just look at this right here right now of course this is like an illustration based on an artist's rendering of the actual monuments so let's just point that out this is not the actual actual but it's based on the actual most of this we've seen at least pictures right of the actual monuments and the paintings and everything you know to say that well yes it is a artistic recreation but it is quite accurate basically right just to give us a little more color and context to this right so right here look at this man right here he's wearing some sort of red i don't know a red fez or a red cap or what have you right and he has his head turned he knows he's gonna get sliced or whatever else like that right and he's putting up his finger like one almost like hold up wait up wait for a moment i don't know if he's gonna say a prayer or whatever let's zoom in on this brother right here right or this black man right here is this not a black man i mean by his complexion by his features the phenotype so forth and so on by his um the clothing so forth and so on as well and he's dark skin and then over here people say well look there's dark skin and light skin so forth and so on. Okay, I, I I hear what you're saying on that right there. Let's go over here, right? And let's show some more right here, right? So we're looking at this one right here for a moment. Now, to be fair, to be fair, it's not just the Jabari, just to show Jabari right here, you know? But he's interesting, you know? He's interesting. His perspective to this is very interesting. His debating and his um his approach to this. You know, there's an avoidance, as we said, to what we have spoken about to really seriously consider it. Because if you seriously consider it, you have to roll back on a lot of his, oh, the Bible in Egypt is so anti-anti-black and comedic, and to recognize we're dealing with human situations among people, right? If my own black brother who's dark skin and I'm dark skin too, if he violates me, right, and I finally get the opportunity to, to, to level it you know, against him, to balance the equation, to give him deuces to what he's been doing to me. Is it that I am anti-black because he happens to be black? But what if I'm black too? Suppose I'm a little bit lighter skinned than my brother who's been abusing me, right? And then I get to, you know, get justice for the abuse that he's doing to me, you know, killing me, throwing my children in the river, throwing my sons in the water, so forth and so on, right? And then we say, well, just let us go to worship. And he doesn't. And we have to go back and forth and back and forth with him. And he has us at the bottom of this society. He puts me on the bottom. Right. Even though I was right up there with him, I helped him out. I served in his, his society. I went along with his culture. But now he puts me at the bottom. Right. And subjects my people. And he happens to be a little bit darker skinned than me. But I'm a little bit maybe lighter skinned than him. Now, when my power, my God, my divine force or myself or whoever now has to use violence. Right. In order to free up myself from his down pressure, his depression. Does that make me now anti 
right? Black because he, he, my brother who's doing all this to me, he happens to be a little bit darker, right? He happens to be a little bit darker than me, right? <laughs> I wonder whether Jabari has this sort of face on, thinking about, you know, if he hears what we're saying. Because, you know, some things he just likes to laugh off and to, you know, treat as though this is the most idiotic thing. This is crazy. You know, I don't know what you're talking about. And instead of addressing it and bring out of your argument what you are talking about or what you don't think that the other person is making a good point about or what the good point about really is. So anyway, not to make this about Jabari because there's many others who also have a similar, oh, we've got to get to this, 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 this nigga right here, here, here. But that's not the point right here, here, here. Right, but just to show a little bit of this. Uh oh, uh oh. All right, let's let's pause for the chorus right here. Now these now these are some of the elders who might be able to give us and have given us a little bit better perspective, right? A better perspective when looking at the various different ancient Black peoples. Whether we are speaking about the Kemetic, Mitzrayim, ancient Egyptian peoples as they are called, or whether the ancient Hebrews, Israelites, the ancient Kushites, or even going to the other side you know, of Far East Africa, the so-called Middle East, and seeing the black peoples over there in ancient Babylon, ancient Akkad, right? The ancient the ancient um, Assyrian people, I sure, you know, going even to the Hindus Kush, right? Some say the Elamite people, you know what I mean? To really get a wide range of different black peoples, right? But here, 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 this is Professor James Smalls right here. Let's bring this over here. Um, international expert on African studies, right um some other events that they are doing also right here 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 i think this is leonard yeah dr leonard jeffries as well recall him from brooklyn college days back when there was all that um interesting controversy you know around black studies and um you know you know black people in the black studies you know in the black studies i remember that that's going back like to the early 1990s and everything but that was i would say at a very important point of what many people in the you could say in the 21st century today because that was the 90s you know and that was the 20th century now we're in the 21st century so most of those who have come into the consciousness really need to check out these professors as well i say they have a little more sober they might not agree with us as hebrews and israelites on everything but they have a little more studied a little more sobered a little more nuanced and correct perspective we would like to get their input on some of the fake egyptology right seeing what happened to him and also i think small i think it was a part of the discussion to go on an ancient in modern Egypt concerning the comedic, the black people, African, you know, the African, um, the African origins of ancient, the black people's origins of ancient Egypt. Because there's a whole different battle that's going on that it seems as though many pro comedic pro ancient Egypt are not dealing with. Right. And they are turning against us as Hebrews and Israelites because of, OK, the Exodus narrative, right, where we celebrate the deliverance, right, from right bondage from a bad situation, according to our narrative and according to the historical narrative. Now, whether others believe that it really happened or not, that's a whole other argument and to say well it, it's, it didn't happen because where are the paintings where are the archaeology where are the papyrus well yeah where are they you can't ask us that you have to ask the egyptian egyptologists in in modern egypt and around the world different museums where they have suppressed they've suppressed a lot of ancient egyptian archaeology on one part because a lot of it will prove their contention Right, which is also our contention that ancient Egypt, its origins come out of black peoples, right? Come out of what we can call the African peoples, right? But then they're suppressing that and they're shutting down all discussion of black Americans, African Americans, scientists, scholars like Leonard Jeffries, Professor Smalls, and so many others who are seeking to have the discussion right at the scene of the crime, right? And then if they're shutting that down, right, for the pro-Egypt people, then what about, say, the pro-Hebrew and Israelite people who are saying that, well, there's evidence there and the evidence has been suppressed 
because we see that the Egyptologists, the modern Arab so-called Egyptologists, modern Egyptian and their European partners, their white European partners, Anglo-American partners, are all in a conspiracy against both groups, the so-called Egypt group. And here's what's interesting. The scripture says that Egypt... We're our power, Jah, Jehovah, Yahweh, Hey, right? Hakadosh Baruch Hu Baruch Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be He, blessed be the name. In other words, the God of Israel, according to the Bible, says that Egypt is my people. But notice we both are being victimized, right, by the suppression and repression of scholarship that can help prove both of our points. In other words, both of our points can be proven. In other words, the pro-black, pro-African Egyptologists, you know, are ones who are into the studies of ancient Egypt. Their points can be proven if those suppressed and repressed, right, artifacts, right, were released and were able to be seen and studied, right? And also amongst those artifacts will also be proof, right, of the Hebrew and Israelite presence as black people. That's one reason why a lot of that is not being brought forward. Because some would say, well, there's the Jews, the white Jews. They would love to have any proof of the exodus or whatnot like that. They know there's proof of the exodus. They know the, narr they know the narrative is true, right? But academically, scholastically, they have to keep doing this dance. And they have to dance even more because black scholars and professors and even amateur scholars and researchers like ourselves are on to them, right? But we need to get past this back and forth like oh ancient egypt was anti-african when the ancient i mean ancient <laughs> ancient you know the bible is anti the exodus is anti-african no that was a black on black crime that's what we have right there it was a black on black crime a black on black crime no, I'm not saying that the Exodus was a black on black crime. The Exodus was the the addressing of the black on black crime, right? That the ancient Egyptians at that particular time, during that particular dynasty, that particular administration, it's not saying that all of the experience of the Hebrews and the Israelites was like that because our narrative, the scripture, the Bible proves that, you know, there was the good, right? And then there was the bad. And then when things got ugly, Right. Something had to, you know, a push had to shove, you know, push came to shove. Right. And that led to the events of the Exodus. And yes, yes, there was a level of violence and a level of death and level of blood. Something that um, Dick Gregory said in his Bible tales. Remember, I, I shared that during the Passover time recently. Something he said in his Bible tales where he spoke about blood. Let me see if I can bring this out. I actually have this document right here. It's a kind of an old book. It's kind of like falling apart. And this is for you, Brother um, Jabari, as well. And this particular book um, is called Dick Gregory's Bible Tales. And he gives a, like a, a rereading, like a rereading to some of the narrative. In other words, he does what a lot of rabbis uh, and sages do even nowadays, like among the European Jews. But the European Jews got this pattern, this principle from their study of the ancient, right? Black Hebrews and Israelites. In the same way that you have a lot of white people today who say that they are ancient Egyptians and all of this, you know, and walk like Egyptian, talk like Egyptian, also the modern Egyptians are doing this kind of thing. And we know that even a little bit that they know is because they've been studying the artifacts of our ancient ancestors. And because they have the access to this, they can just kind of, you know, leak out a little bit, a little bit. So the little bit that we get to see is only a fraction of a percent of all that they are seeing and all that they are witnessing. So they only give us like a little bit like a cherry off of the top of the cake. Right. Right. We barely even get to taste the, um, you know, the uh, what do you call it? The. Um, What's that? What's that on top of the cake? I'm, really, I'm not really a cake person, but um, the icing. You know, we don't even get to taste the icing on the cake, much less ta taste the cake, right? But they'll talk about the cake, you know? They'll talk about it, right? And then our scholars and everything will just believe them, right? Because they'll show a little something and they'll talk about a lot of other things that they don't show us, get to show us. But here is something that um, Dick Gregory said right here. It was an interesting, the plague of blood. He was talking about blood, right? And he said, yeah, he said, the plague of blood symbolizes a tragic reality. So often negotiations between nations and individuals happen only after bloodshed. 
sometimes what is it? This is this is reality. Speaking reality, right? Not mythologically, right? So often negotiations between nations and individuals happen only after bloodshed. Dick Gregory goes on here and let my people go. Dick Gregory's Bible tales in his commentary right here. He says, skyjackers or bank robbers come to terms only after the blood of hostages has been threatened or spilled. Prison reform occurs after inmates riot. Shots are fired and blood is shed. Nations sit down at the treaty table, usually only after war and killing. Secretary of State Kissinger becomes a Middle East mediator after the shedding of Arab and Israeli blood. This is Dick Gregory here speaking in this particular book, um, Dick Gregory's Bible Tales, right? And he says that Pharaoh was willing to negotiate. We say Pharaoh is like saying the White House. And we say like the White House, there's different administrations at different times, a different White House. Sometimes it's better. Then at other times, sometimes some administration is so bad that even the, their own people who elected their own native administrators are disgusted, are, are unhappy with their own rulership, and they want to change their own government because their rulers that they elected or, you know, co-signed are not serving their interests. So even among a people and having their own people in office or in power don't always serve or make their own people happy or feel safe or content. Is that racism? Is that against that? You know, it's, it's a human condition. We're just dealing with the reality of the human condition. Pharaoh was willing to negotiate in earnest only after his own son was killed. Countless Hebrew mothers. Here's, here's the point that Dick Gregory made that we want ones like, say, Jabari to at least hear. Whether they, how they take it. I guess we'll see, we'll hear, right? He says, countless Hebrew mothers and fathers had lost sons. Before the Exodus, countless who? Hebrew mothers and fathers had lost who? Sons. So even the sons were targeted according to the Exodus narrative. So we look at the narrative in terms of the narrative, right? And then we come to the Exodus and we really accept just the narrative in terms of the narrative. Whether you want to believe the narrative happened or not, but just as like you're reading, or reading a story, reading a document. Right. And not being invested, like it's taking a special interest on this side or that side. Look at it as a human condition. Look at it as if the Egyptians, the Kemetics were in Israel. Right. And they had come in. Right. And they had came in and we, they, they became like rulers, like Joseph became. But it, it, the whole thing was reversed. Right. And the Hebrews were killing their sons, the Kemetic, the Egyptian sons. You know, I remember all the, they're all strangers in our land. Right. And then a little later on, we start to like, you know, um, put them in like they had to force them in all sort of like do all the dirty work. We push them to the bottom of our society, even though they were, you know, near the top of the society and they had served us so well. Right. And then they was asking, well, you know, we just need some time to go away and to worship our gods or God or gods, nature, nature. Right? They just wanted to go away outside of the, the bounds of our land for a couple of days out into the wilderness to worship. And we were telling them, no, no. And we gave them more labor and everything else. And then they finally decided to call upon their gods, right, and say if it was possible for their natures, natural, to deliver them from our oppression, our downpression, would you consider the Kemetics in that situation with everything reversed? Would you consider them being anti-African, anti-black, seeing that we both are black people? See, there's the point, right? We both are black people. So it's not about the outer complexion or color, right? It's about the inner humanity or the inhumanity. It got to a point, if you just read the Exodus narrative, where it was like enough is enough. See, people want to look at the last part of it. Right. They only see the part where, you know, the the little woman turns around and takes a two by four and knocks the big man down. Right. And you say, whoa, how did she do that? She just, you know, instead of recognizing what the little woman went through. Now, I use that as that example. Well, let's put it in another way. Right. You see someone knock your favorite person down because you love this favorite person. You idolize this favorite person. This favorite person can do no wrong to you. This is your favorite person. This is how like ones like Jabari and everything approach Egypt. Egypt just can't do no wrong, right? Egypt just has done no wrong, right? Trying to make Egypt as this perfect paradigm and everything, it has done no wrong. Of course, he would say, no, he don't think that. Of course, he knows there's good, bad, and ugly. So let's, tell us about it. 
tell us about it from ancient Egypt. See, our Bible, the scriptures, tells us about the good, the bad, and the ugly, right, of the children of Israel, as well as the reality of people. See, that's the difference between so-called the Bible and, you know, our scriptures and spirituality and, say, the spirituality of others, including, generally speaking, of ancient Egypt. This is a different approach. Some just talk about all the warm and fuzzy and all the beautiful, the nice things, you know, all the perfect fantasies of everything just wonderful and nice, you know, you know, on the spiritual realms, right? But then it doesn't have anything to do with the reality. It's disconnected with the reality. When we look at Egyptian spirituality from our perspective, right? It's nice. It's some principles, morals, maxims, like he liked to go into the maxims of Patahotep or whatnot like that. It's great. That's all great, but the reality of it doesn't really address anything really on the ground, right? It addresses that which is underground, right? That which happens in the afterlife, right? Going before the gods and the claiming, you know, disclaiming every bad thing you did, you know, by a bunch of negative confessions and then going into a Shangri-La afterlife. Everything is wonderful. But we know that that's not, that's like the same way that the Bible was flipped around and people want to die and go to heaven in the sky when the Bible actually speaks 180 degrees opposite of that. See, our, the Bible, our scripture speaks 180 degrees opposite of that fantasy that many Latter-day Christians have. But when you look at that fantasy that many Latter-day Christians have, it just seems similar to what we are able to know and discern from ancient Egyptology. I'm talking about spirituality. So we look at reality. So when we look at the Exodus, we have to look at the Exodus in reality. Oh, that it were so for black people over here in the Americas, right? And the Caribbean, right? You know, it's like... People look at, what's his name, um, Turner, Nat Turner. You remember Nat Turner? <laughs> it's almost like saying that what Nat Turner did, right? It's like saying that what Nat Turner did was wrong. Some, some people do think so. They say, why did he kill children? Why did he kill the little, you know, the, 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 the little white boy and girl or, you know, the, you know, the master's children? Why did he do that? He could have just killed master. He just killed the man. He didn't have to kill his wife. Why did, he, why did, why did the slaves, the enslaved, the br brutalized and enslaved black people or Africans, if you please, why did they do that in their uprising? Right? They were wrong. And to this very day, there are ones who were... First of all, they will concede to the point that, yes, Nat Turner and them, they were, you know, enslaved, you know, and they were no doubt experiencing awful, God-awful things. But why did they kill the little children? Wait, oh, wow. You see what I'm saying? But then when you flip it around, right, when you start to flip it around, we see a whole different context. Like when we look at these same so-called Europeans and Christians and even Jews, like look at the state of Israel today. They will say the state of Israel today has the right to defend itself, even if it uses force, even if it uses um, violence. It has a right to defend itself. But now, when speaking about black people, a particular group of black people, right? Speaking about the Hebrews, a particular group of black people who also have, you know, to say that the Hebrews were anti African. One must recognize that Hebrew is an Afro-Asiatic, Afro-Afro-Afro language. That's like saying that they're against themselves. That's like saying if my own flesh and blood brother, right, is trying to choke me to death, and I'm, I'm trying to tell him, get stop it, stop it, please stop. And I, my hand can reach a two by four, right, and he's choking me to death, and I take the two by four and I knock him, I knock him out. Right? Maybe I kill him with the with what you call him. Then people say, oh, you killed your brother. Oh, you're a bad, wicked person. Right? But I said, but he was choking me and I was dying. Right? And you say, well, well, you shouldn't have, but you could have taken something else. You didn't have to hit him. What it is, is that you like my brother. You idolize my brother. My brother can do no wrong right, to you. You think he's so wonderful. And in a sense, you would have allowed for him to kill me right because you just co-sign for everything he do there's the, there's a cognitive dissonance in your mind that you can't see that your brother was doing evil to me right would not even let me go worship was killing my sons was killing all the male children this is what the narrative of the exodus says about that particular period of time that particular period of administration you know it's like there was a baby bush remember baby bush was um president 
you know, and a lot of people look at different time periods. Oh, oh, not even go back to Bush. Let's go back to Trump. You know how when Trump got out of office and Trump was getting voted out and he got out of office and everybody started to pretend like, oh, wow, what a relief. Oh, man, those Trump days. And when Trump was in power, it's like people could not, a lot of people could not sit, sit still because of, you know, the fears of what was going on and of what they thought that Trump might do. They didn't know he could start World War II. He could destroy America. He, look what he's doing to the, the, to the immigrants. You know, remember he was putting the immigrants, separating the immigrants, you know, the, 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 the men and women from their children, putting them, abusing people. <laughs> Y'all recall all of that, right? But that was just one administration, right? Wasn't that just one administration? That was one rulership, right, of the Pharaoh, of the Great House, of the White House. And then before that, it was different. And then so-called after that, it seems to be different. Now they got forbidden. I mean, for Biden, forbidden. They have Biden there, right? Some people are beginning to recognize, well, it's not quite the same as Trump. But basically, the more things change, the more things seem to stay the same. It's just a different style. It's still the same White House. It's still the same Pharaoh, the same system, right? But who are the rulers? The rulers at that period of time? The people obviously must have seen what the Hebrews were going through. And even in the Bible narrative, it says, even in the Bible narrative, it says um, that some of the Egyptian servants of Pharaoh right, also believe in Yahweh, in Yahweh, in the, in the Elohim of the Hebrews. That's why if we continue to read the narrative, we get the mixed multitude. So it even shows that some of the Hebrews, right, Right, had been able to influence right some of the Egyptians, and the Egyptians were with the Hebrews, and they came out with the Hebrews. We could say that some of the Hebrews were actually Egyptians. When I say Hebrews, I'm saying we are defining Hebrew as based on one's faith, right? Based on one's faith. You know what I mean? I crossed over. They crossed over. They crossed over from, say, the idol worship and the worship of ancient Mitzrayim, of ancient Kemet, and now they were into the what we regard as the true worship, the worship of the true power, the true, the nature of natures, Yahweh. Right? And that's in the Bible, that's in the scripture, that's in the Exodus narrative as well. So that even shows you the fuller context of it. It wasn't as some people would like, you know, to make believe. So these people right here, are these people right here celebrating the death of, um, of, of, of millions of Africans? Or are they actually celebrating right, the fact that their people was delivered from bad black people? They are black people celebrating their deliverance from other people who are black, but these other people are black just because they all were black, they didn't see themselves as the same people. Like we say today, because you're my, 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 my skin, folk you know my you know my my skin folk you're not my kin folk because you're my color you're not my kind so you see how we're looking at it or a lot of other ones are looking at this very very superficially right well if you look at the exodus narrative in a very superficial sense it's possible to come to that conclusion in fact we see these black people here you think they're happy because black people that the point of it is because the egyptians were black that's not the point of the Exodus. The point of the Exodus has nothing to do with them being black or even with them being so-called Kemetic or with them being even Mitzrayim. It's talking about what was being done against the lives and the interests of Hebrew people, of the Bnei Yisrael. According to the narrative, they could not just get up and even just leave. People say, well, if they didn't like it, why didn't they just leave? They could not. That's the whole point that the narrative brings out, that they could not just get up and leave. You know, that's the whole point right there, that Paro Pharaoh would not even let them take a, a break, right? They could not even go on a little vacation, right? They were asking for a, like a worship vacation, like a pilgrimage vacation. That's how the whole narrative begins. And a lot of people willingly, right, gloss over those parts of the narrative, right, and just focus to the epicenter. You know, it's like a woman being abused and being raped, and then she 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 kills the rapist, right? And when she kills the rapist, everyone is arguing that she is a murderer, like she was intending to kill this rapist. She was telling the rapist, "Stop! No, don't do this!" Right? But the rapist was out of their mind, right? And the rapist only sobered up, right? Like Dick Gregory says right here, you know, um, after bloodshed. Well, not, the rapist didn't even sober up, but the rapist was stopped, 
right? And then anybody else who might have been considering to do what the first rapist was doing would have to actually like step back and say, do I want that fate to be my fate? So Fowle was willing to negotiate in earnest only after his own son was killed. Countless Hebrew mothers and fathers had lost sons, but Fowle only listened when death came to his own household. Right. And even people say, well, what about the other people? There were a lot of other people. The Bible says there was not one house in which there was not one dead. If people go along for government, that means they support the actions of that government. It's like today. If the United States government, oh, let's look at the, the Trump thing. Remember the Trump thing? They were putting um, children, it was taking children to, with the immigrants. They were like separating families and separating children from their, from their parents and just separating families at the border and all that stuff was going on. Didn't that outrage you? Didn't that outrage a lot of people? Right? You know, some people that bothered, that bothered some people. Right? Why did that bother some people? Right? Because they say, imagine that. You are separating families and putting children even through this trauma of separation. What do the children, I heard people saying, what do the children have to do with it? Right? What do the children have? Or oh, people come across the border, say illegally or whatnot like that, as they like to say, right? They come across the border and some people say, well, they should just let them into the country because of the children. My point is that everyone can argue for everyone's children, but nobody's arguing for the Hebrew children the Israelite children, what about the Hebrew sons, the Israelite sons? And because many black people, conscious pro-black people, you know, like the Jabaris and others, really don't get it, this is the reason why what happens to us as black people continues to happen. Think about it. We will complain and say, look how unfairly we are being treated as black people over here in America. Police brutality, um, um, red line districting, uh, uh, I mean, there's a whole list. Right? There's a whole, a whole rap sheet of the things against us. Right? And we are the only ones who complain about this. Right? It seems like others, you know, it doesn't bother them. Why? Because they're not affected. Other population groups in America, you know, whether they are immigrants, recent immigrants, or immigrants from past time, are not affected by the same thing. So when we complain about things and when we are saying this is wrong, other groups say, oh, oh that's the past. Just let's leave it alone. Let's move past that. Forget that. It's not a problem. But then when something happens with them, they make it a front and center news. It become a big issue in society. There are reforms and changes. But for us as black people, and then we will say, wait, hold on. We've been over here for this long and this is still happening. This wrong is still happening to us. And not that it's just even still happening. It's never being addressed by anyone but us. It's like we are only talking about this to ourselves. When we ever bring, raise the issue, people say it's a past issue. You know, you know, leave it alone. You know, we, let's move past that. But the loss of a loved one caused Paro, caused Fowl, the great house, the rulers, and all of the even rank and file people who supported the rulers to put pressure on the Fowl to just let these people go. That's what it comes down to. The, the Fowl would not let the people go. Right. And a lot of that population it's like today when sometimes these um, I don't want to put in this term because then people want to then bring up the terrorism kind of point. We don't want to even go there right now, you know, but a lot of times when even things happen today, sometimes the West or people in the West, the Western Gentiles will excuse it. Like over in another country, when the rank and file people, the common people pick up arms to overthrow a government, right? People in America will say that's their human rights. If people over here in America start to pick up arms to overthrow their local government or whatever, they'll send in, you know, the, you know, they'll send in the, um, the you know, the, the National Reserve, Special Forces or whatever else. They'll send in the army. We already seen it happen in the Boston. Remember the Boston Marathon and everything? We already seen a glimpse of that right there. You know, but they'll support revolutions outside in other countries for their political interests. They'll support that there. Right. And the same reasons that they give for the other countries is their human rights because their human rights was being violated. And in ancient Egypt, the Israelites and the Hebrews human rights was being violated. Right. I'm talking the human rights, not the human rights declaration today, but the basic principles of that even yesterday still apply. Didn't these people have the right to worship their own God?
And if worshiping their own God in Egypt would have been a problem because our worship sacrifice would have might have insulted the native Egyptian. That was a reason why Moses and them had called for, you know, give us a couple of days off. Right. We're going to go into the wilderness and we're going to worship. And they had to go back and forth and negotiate and Pharaoh, the government first was like, like, yeah, OK. And then it was like, no, you can't. You are lazy and gave them more work and started to downpress and oppress them more. So was it anti-African to say anti-black or was it anti-oppression? Right. Downpression, whether it was black or white or whatever. And this is the last point that. Um, Dick Gregory says right here, he says, I wonder how many wars would be avoided if the loved one of national leaders were the first soldiers to face enemy fire. That's how he ends it off. The section, um, let my people go in Dick Gregory's Bible tales. He says, I wonder how many wars would be avoided if the loved ones of national leaders were the first soldiers to face enemy fire. Here, Dick Gregory got the biblical point. He, he got the Bible point. He wasn't trying to preach Judaism or preach, you know, being Hebrews or Israelites on that level. But he was applying the scriptural, the biblical narrative to our situation as black people and finding it to be deuces. Right. Finding that the same situation we were in with black people in ancient times is only a change of race and ethnicity is the same situation that we face even worse in these latter days and times right so the exodus is not anti-african why because they were africans so-called quote unquote you know remember we already have a point of view on that term african so latter day terminology that doesn't really apply to the ancient world but for people today to understand the general argument they were not anti-africans because they were africans so if one african right tribe goes against another african tribe that's ruling and saying y'all are abusing and exploiting and killing us and killing our children and we want out we want to worship no you can't worship we want to leave no you can't leave what are they to do jabari you know the rest of you what are they to do they're both black people now they're both black people so you, so you're choosing favorites in this situation you should choose the side of the abused people the people that were suffering abuse so according to the context of exodus and the narrative Right. You should actually, in this case, support the Hebrews and the Israelites and really investigate right, whether that particular pharaoh, pharaonic, whether every pharaoh or every rulership, every dynasty was correct. Right? We have critique from ancient Egyptians regarding ancient Egyptians. They critique little man to the big man right one one um priest order to the next priest order because there's many different denominations we have this kind of false view that egypt was all united in its ways no there was good bad and ugly and it so happens that the exodus basically is focusing now on our narrative our story it's like as long as the hunter you know writes the story the hunter is the hero Right. So only time that the um, that the hunted right will become the hero of the story. Right. Is when the hunted, you know, writes the story. I think I I'm not saying that as well as it is this, this parable about like it's only when the lion writes the, the story that the lion is the hero. But as long as the hunter writes the story, right, the hunter is the hero. But only when the lion, only when the victim begins to write the story. So here we have the victim. When we look at the scriptures, the Torah, the Bible, the book of Exodus, we are seeing the victim, right? We are hearing from the victim, the victim now, right? The victim is telling the victim story, right? The victim basically is speaking here, right? And the, um, the, the victimizer, right? The victimizer is being addressed, but through our voice, right? Now, if you go back to ancient Egypt, we can't really be sure whether it was not talked about because we can't really be sure whether we're getting to see and getting access to all the archaeology. In fact, we can be pretty certain that we are not getting access to all the archaeology. In other words, we can be pretty confident that everything that can be shared and disclosed, right, is not being shared and disclosed with us. Why? For two reasons. One, it will prove the 
say the Egyptologists and the pro-Kemetics that say that e ancient Egypt has black African roots. And then as we get all the evidence, we'll be also able to see that, wow, the Hebrews and the Israelites were in Egypt. And wow, they were black people too. So that means the Beta Israel of Ethiopia and the other Beta Israel and other communities that already have testified for thousands of years of this fact and still are living witnesses right, to the Israelites being black people, they were right and accurate all this time. So what was all this, the, the faux argument, the false arguments? This was all kind of a divide and conquer strategy, right? A divide and conquer strategy. So no, the Exodus is not anti-African. Right? The Exodus actually is anti-oppression, um, exploitation, right? and just happens to highlight the ancient view of the ancient world where there was mainly black people, namely black peoples, different shades, different complexions, but still black people all the same, were well, black people all the same so here there's one other thing i like to show before we out of here on this right here and it's now flipping around the question right as we are stating right here that no ancient egypt right was not look how the ethiopians show themselves as kind of red and brown and dark skin different shades and complexions we see this also with ancient egypt ancient egypt was not a monolith Right? It began off from a particular group of people, like we say the native, the Romu, the root race people, Romu, Oromo, Romu, Remu, right? those ancient peoples. But here I like to show this right here, King Tut. Tell us, tell us, tell us, tell us. Well, the, do you think these people are anti-African? Are they anti-Kushite? The anti-Hamite? Do you think these people are anti-African right here? Do you think this man is anti-African, anti-Kushite, anti-Ethiopian, right? anti-Hamite, anti-Kushite, anti-Ethiopian? Do you think this man here, he's anti-black, right? He's anti-Kushite, he's anti-Ethiopian, right? How about these here, anti-African, anti-Kushite, anti-Egyptian? You think they're anti-ancient Egyptian, anti-Kemetic, anti-Hemetic, right? <laughs> no, no, my father's house, there are many mansions. Right, many mansions. If it was not so, then we would not have told you. You think because he's holding right here this flag, who we are proven actually was a flag associated with Ethiopian and Israelites of Ethiopia and we black people, Beta Israel here in America peoples, Ethiopian Hebrew peoples, even before it was adopted, right, by the latter day state of Israel. But he's also anti black. Right? Is she anti-black? She's anti-African? Is she anti-African? The whole fight right here amongst these people as black people and as also nowadays as they call us Africans is the whole epicenter of what's going on, right? Even in that region of the world, right? So it's ludicrous, right? Some might even say, well, because they are arguing against the white Jews, Right about the white Jewish, like the racism, white supremacy, white Jewish racism to black Jewish and black Hebrew is like people. One could say, well, they're anti-Jewish. They're anti, are they anti-Semitic? You see how this anti-argument is a very dubious, it's a very dubious argument. These people are in modern terms, you see the behind says Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a nation is Africa. They basically are black people. They are African. Do they celebrate and observe Passover? Yes, they do. When they observe Passover, is it rejoicing because of the death of black African people? No, it's rejoicing because of stopping the death of black African people who happen to be Hebrews and Israelites and the beta Israel. This is what it's about right here you see them right here as hebrews as jews ethiopian jews and as israelites so from so on they are fighting against the racism of the so-called white jewish ashkenazi you know the white jewish racism over there right some would even say well because they on the jewish side the european white jewish side they might want to say that oh they are they are anti-semitic right because they are going against the white racism so what it's actually doing is changing the goalposts Right? So when one say that the Exodus is anti-African, they're trying to change the goalposts. Right? They're trying to actually cover up right, for the anti-African behavior right, of the ancient Egyptians. 
right? There was anti, because the Hebrews and the Israelites are African black people and were African black people, right? And the only way that can fly is if these ones like Jabari and the rest of them are actually saying that they believe, and I really do think that they believe that the real Hebrew Israelite people were not black. They believe that the real Hebrew Israelite people were the white Jewish people. This is what they believe. Mm -hmm. Either that, at one time they try to act like, well, the Hebrew Israelite people didn't exist. When more and more evidence comes out that, well, they did exist, right? They then tried to make it seem like, well, they wasn't you black people. Like like that old crazy doctor was named Dr. Reggie. Say so you're a convert. You're a convert. What do you know about? Then he started to quote these different, you know, um, Judaic, um, you know, um, books. You know, like the Mishnah this and the Talmud this and the other thing this, right? As to say, that really matters, right? Um, how about these black Christian people? These black Christian people, are they? You think they they are anti-black too? <laughs> Right? You think they're anti-black? They might be a lot of things, but are they really anti-black? Right? I mean, that is the main point. That we as black people, right, whether it's black on black crime, right, or whether it's white on black racism, it's equal deuces. It, it doesn't matter. It's not about, right, um, being, we are not the ones who are against people because of their color or even their lack of it. Yes, true. There is some knee-jerk reactions that do happen and have happened, right? Because of the long endurance of downpression. Now, one thing, one thing we find, one thing we find to be a, a true, a, a truism, if we can use that phrase right there, but a truth concerning ancient. Egypt, ancient Mitzrayim. And, and, and what is this truth that we find concerning ancient Egypt and ancient Mizraim? A truth that they were equal opportunity, that from a true perspective. So even though some of the Kemetic and the pro-Kemetic um, scholars like Jabari and others and Reggie don't really want to be completely fear and honest in their assessment, they have a bias. We're going to seek to be a little more fear and balance and recognize that we don't think that ancient Egypt was just against one, you know, group of people. They were against anybody who wasn't them. They were so self-absorbed and self-centered, right, that they were against all other people, whether they were black, whether they were the same complexion or not, right? They were just against all people. And they were equal opportunity. Um, um, I'm not going to say, I'm not going to use this term enslavers. I might have to just to make the argument. But they, they captured people regardless of who they were. As we can see right here, we see a dark skin, right? Here appears to be like, you see three different just complexions of what we can refer to as black people. Believe it or not, black people do have those sort of complexions. We see a dark skin one right there. We see the nine bowls. Remember the nine bowls? The nine bowls were those who the ancient Egyptians considered to be their, their existential enemies, right? It's not like, like today they talk about terrorism. You know, Al-Qaeda and this one and that one. There's different cliques and different sets and everything. This is like what was going on among the ancient Egyptians, right? And this is like the nine, three, six, nine, right? And as we go through this, this occurred in ancient Egypt. Let's scroll past some of the alphabeticals right there. And let's look over here. Here we have the Book of Gates. So we see different peoples in the Book of Gates, four basic races, right? Or ethnicity, nationality, but they call them like the four seeds, right? Here we have um, ones that would look like Egyptians. Some of the, the painting is, is marred. You can see that there are parts where the paint has chipped off. But you can basically see where they seem to appear to be Egyptians. At least they are in the style of Egypt, you know. They have the loincloth, the hairstyle. Also, the, the coloring appears similar to the coloring of, of ancient Egyptians, right? Okay, here's one of the kind of, um, I think, like a redo of Seti's tomb. We're not going into, um, right? We're not going into, this is many Egyptians came from Mesopotamia, which is currently Iraq, and were more Middle Eastern in appearance. Many resembled our, says our creators, the Anunnaki. So I don't know who's doing this, but this is the meme that we caught. Here's what we're going to bring it to. You see the one that says Kush, Upper Nubia, Northern Sudan? This is all containing the nine bowls, 
right? You see this one right there? This one is dark skin, it's black. The other one is a little lighter, the one from Mesopotamia. The other one is roughly the same complexion but have these locks and everything like that. They are all captives. They are all captives. You could say they are all captives and potential slaves or bondmen. This is what we talk about when we talk about bondmen. The scripture doesn't mention slave, it mentions bondmen. Right? So here, just to kind of show who's who, right? Show a couple of these. Now I want to show you something else. King Tut shoes. Have you ever seen King Tut shoes? My right? King Tut shoes. This is approximate, they say positioning. Except those who were the Tamahu, the Libyan type, which was the Canaanite type, they were also in the Asiatic region. Right? But this is a, actually a better do. This one here has the ones looking very goofy. Right? So this is a, a better a redo of it, which is more like accurate. It has the typology from Seti's tomb. Right? Then we see down here, right? Um, where some say the ta ta nessi, right? Nessi, nessiu, the nessiu, the nessiu, nehesiu, nehesiu, nessiu, the Nubian type, right? The Nubian type, right? And this is often the one that one's referred to as this is the black people. Right, so in Egyptian archaeology and 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 um, um, Egyptology regards this to be the quote Negro. Now we already know this is based on the racist, you know, the racist, uh, you know, the racist um, white white racism, white supremacy. This is their racist um, setting, right? That this is the Negro. This is the only one that's black. So they would tell you, and a lot of the arguments are like, this is the black people. The Egyptian wasn't black. This one here is the black one, right? But what's interesting about you see, they even have black at the bottom. Next one is red. Next one is yellow. But we know that the one that's yellow is not really yellow, right? The one that's reddish brown, right? Is reddish brown, and the other one is more reddish, but a little, a little maybe lighter, but similar. Actually, the two, the red and the yellow in actuality had similar complexions right and then we had the nubian right or the nehesia right which was had a darker the more stereotypical black complexion and then we had the white or the tamahu right which was actually a variation of the canaanitish right the canaanitish so here this is also kind of a racial chart by the european scholarship that needs to be re-looked at Right, we need to relook at all of this. But this is kind of what we're working with. You see what they say? Racial types from Egyptian tomb paintings after Champollion. Now you can see also how, except for the so called Nubian, right, how they even change the features. You know how they change the features to make the features more Eurocentric. It's not as we see the actual. Just to note that right there. Now here, I want to touch on this right here. This is the part of King Tut shoe, right? King Tut shoes. Those who are on the bottom of the King Tut shoes. Who who's this? Does this is like a brethren? I know a lot of brethren. I could say today look just like this. A lot of I and I Rastafari Hebrew and Israelite brothers look just like this, right? Or have this similarity, right? In look, right? If we go a little bit closer, I thought I saw in the headband red, gold, and green, right? But this now comes from King Tut's shoe, right? You can see he has his hands bound behind his back. So it seemed like the Egyptians were very used to, and we see a lot of monuments and wall paintings where we see people and men with their hands behind their back. Put your hands behind your back. They were arresting a lot of people, right? The ancient Egyptians were like the ancient police officers, right? And you know how we feel about the police officers. Does it matter if a police officer is black or white? It, it, it really doesn't matter because they both are going to put you, right, or they have orders to put you under arrest. Now, look at the black right here. Look at the dark-skinned black one that they stereotypically say, this is you, black man, woman and child. You're the black. You wasn't the Egyptian. You was the one in captivity. This is all from King Tut's tomb. From King Tut's tomb. This is the aspect or this is the area that a lot of the Egyptologists, the Kemeticists, right, don't speak about. They don't speak about this. I mean, they might speak about it in passing, right? But we have to go deeper in this because if they go too deep in this, it's going to break this this um, this fantasy, right? This this latter-day black people cometic fantasy. The fantasy is like the ancient Egyptians did no wrong, right? The ancient Egyptians. So the ancient Egyptians did no wrong. They were perfect people. 
Now, many of them say, of course, they wasn't perfect people, right? Okay, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Could it be that at a time of their, their gross imperfection, this exodus occurred? That the exodus occurred, right, because of the lack of ma'at that was being expressed against the Hebrews and the children of Hebrews? Is it ma'at to throw babies, right, male children, right, into the river and kill them? Is that ma'at? Is it my aunt to enslave a group of people or put them in bondage who otherwise were basically for all intents and purposes Egyptian? It's like almost like people come to America and they get nationalized as as Americans. They get all into the American culture. Right? They know that they come from someplace else, but they all, they're living like American, paying taxes and everything. And now you're targeting them because you remember that they are immigrants. They really don't belong around here. They're really not from here. And you want to blame them for every bad thing that's happening. Look at how the Americans and the Westerners, how they blame the immigrants for all the bad things that's going on. And then they make it seem like, oh, we brought you in here because you were suffering as a refugee. And now you do this to us after we put you in the subsidized housing and give you state funded social services and everything else and you dare complain because of police brutality because we're throwing your your asses in jail you know what i'm saying that's what they do that's exactly and here's what's so interesting even though we're talking about white people today in this latter-day white supremacy gentile system the same basic injustices also occurred when black people Rule the world, when we rule the world, when we rule the world, when we was kings, when you was kings, the same things was going on, right? It's the human reality. See, it's, see, we have to look at things in reality, right? The reality. So the good, the bad, the ugly. This is why the Torah, the scripture says to Hebrews and to Israelites, we should not abhor Right, the the Mitzrim, the Mitzrayim, the Mitzri, the ancient Kemetic, the ancient Egyptian, right, or the Egyptian, basically. But speaking about from the ancient times, right, even to the, well, you know, because we were strangers, right, we were what strangers in their land. In other words, our power reminds us of their hospitality to us, right, in spite of the later, the latter, in hospital inhospitalities right or the inhospitable way that they treated our later like the later generation so for us to look at that the whole time in egypt as some hebrews and israelites do you know was bondage is wrong right to look at like well the, the whole time there there was not any wrong and the egyptians were you know they they were de dealing with us like they dealt with everybody else and there was no problem no a new administration even the torah puts it into the context of a new administration which in the beginning of the book of Exodus, that would actually tell any um, clear, objective reader that, oh, it's making a time difference here. It's saying, well, at this time, you ever been somewhere and things were good up until a certain time? Things were going good. And then you remember at that time when there was a change, somebody else came into it, somebody else was running it. And when somebody else began to run it, things started to change. Things started to go proverbially downhill, so to speak. That is the biblical narrative. Here, 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 is this, uh, this is like a Nubian right here, right? You can see the so-called um, stereotypical so-called black or African features here. Look at this right here, right? So one is upside down, they, they're bounded. You see the hands bounded. This is all from like King Tut and others tomb. Not going there, not going there. Okay, right here, let's go over here. Let's go over here. Now, these are like the nine bowls. These are the ones that were... Now, of course, it's like a later dynasty, but as we start to look at the history, these were kind of like, um, you know, the terroristic the terroristic threats, right, to ancient Egypt. Let's find those shoes, because we can go be here for a moment, but we want to just find these shoes right here. Let's look at this right here, all right? Now, when you see over here, you see the Egyptians are going against these people. Some of them look like Asiatics, right? Some of them even, you know, yeah, look, you can see the black, the dark skin feature, and you can see the Egyptians going after them, right? On the chariots, okay, right? This right here now gives us like a kind of a long view of the, the, the enemies, 
right the enemies of ancient Egypt now notice something right here how many dark-skinned black or overtly black there's one two three four right four out of one two three four five six seven eight nine the nine bowls so of the nine bowls four almost nearly half four of the nine bowls right were um kush were kush people right were kush people or were dark-skinned black people that i guess people will call negroes so who was against who right i guess we could say the egyptians were a little bit against black people too against africans too right look at this right here right all captured prisoners of egypt including non-negroid ones right so including non-black ones right so that means that the Egyptians didn't say, oh, well, you black, we're not going to, we're just going against these other people, right? So that means that possibly, potentially, right, when they abuse or downpress or oppress people, because there was oppression in Egypt. We're not saying that there was oppression in Egypt from beginning to end, but there was oppression in Egypt from time to time. Right? And we're looking at the Exodus as a particular time when this oppression or downpression took place. Right? There's one other area here. Let's get to this right here. Let's get to those shoes. Right? Trying to get to those shoes. Those shoes. Remind me of one of the Psalms that actually talk about the shoes right here. Right? So we can see right here, even here you can see somebody on their knees. Right, and you can see the black legs of the Egyptians right there, and then at the bottom you can see all of those who are captured. So let's recognize that there was people who were in bondage, right, or captivity, right? And what do you do with captured people? That's the question. What do you do with captured people? We have an answer, but just wants to just think about that question for a moment. What do you do with captured people? Well, basically, you could almost do whatever you like with captured people, right? And from time to time, especially in the time of the Exodus, right, we get to see that with people who were under their rulership, they were quite well able to do whatever they want, and nothing, or nothing, no human reasoning provoked them to even let the Egyptians, the Egyptians, to let the Hebrews go and worship their own God. I, you know, they said, just give us some time off to go worship our God. You know, we'll return. We'll be back. You know, and, you know, fire was like, you know, it was like, no, nah, you people are lazy. You know, you have a lot of free, you got too much, you got too much free time, right? You got too much free time on your hands. If that means you got a lot of free time. So we're going to give you some more burdens, some more work, right? You know? And we know how it is when we're working a job and, you know, we think we've done all that we're supposed to do. And, you know, we can't even get a break. We can't even get a day off. You know how y'all feel if you're working someplace and you want to take a vacation and they keep saying no, no, no. And then they even give you more work. Right now, if it's, if it's black people that do it, if it's people who believe in ma'at that do it, right, who believe in the pur im haru that do it, does that make it any better? Would that make it any better? Right? Y'all who are pro Egypt, right? If a if a pharaoh licked you side the head with with a ankh, right, and knocked out your eye and your teeth and everything, would that make it better? Because he believed in Ma'at. He believed in Horus, Isis, and Ra and all that. That would make it different because you believe the same thing. Okay. Right? So here, here, let's look on King Tut. Right? King Tut more actually actually looked. Right, not like that recreation nonsense of the latter day racist modern Egyptian. But you seen this before? This is all part of like the King Tut shoes and everything. I don't know if you've seen this before. Right. So one thing we can say about ancient Egyptians is that if they had to capture black people from Kush, remember Kush and all that was where the Egyptian origins came from in Africa, from came from the headwaters of the Nile. They talked about that in the oldest writings. So these are the people who are from those same regions, but they looked at them to be less than. You know what I mean? You know how some people will think like, well, we today are so much smarter than our ancestors. Like, we today are so much smarter than our parents, and we're so much smarter than our grandparents. We're so much smarter than our great-grandparents. A lot of people believe that. A lot of people believe that we're wiser, we're smarter. You know, like, things are better now. 
than they were before because we are wise and technologically more advanced. So we know more, right? You think so? So here, just a couple of pictures right here. You notice these canes? These are some interesting walking canes. Mm -hmm. Now these are interesting walking canes because it kind of shows us something of the different people groups and people types. So the ancient Egyptians looked at these people, even though they might look different right here, right, to be all part of the same thing. They, they basically circle them all together the same thing. This is like what we have in the beginning of Exodus. When it says that, you know, less like 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 the Hebrews might join up with our enemies if there arises a war. You remember? It's in the beginning of Exodus talking about there might arise a war, right? And these people might join, like the Hebrews, the Israelites might join together, right, with these other people. And now we see the nine bows, right? We see the nine bows. Let's go right here. Let's go right here. Should a war arise right here? Let's see, a war, let's go over here, a war, why right? should there be war, right, and let's go, and them, and them, right, boom, right there, the first verse, right, we put war and enemies, right, or and them, we have Exodus 1 and 10, chapter 1, verse 10, come on, this is like the new administration, so the Hebrews, the Israelites were in Mitzrayim for a few generations, right? A few generations up to this point of the Exodus. And there's a new pharaoh, there's a new king, a new government, new rulers come in. And here's where we link it with the Ahmose, Kamose, Ahmose, and what will lead eventually to the Tutmoside, Tutmoside, Tut, right? I mean, Tutmosis, right? And that whole generation with Hatshepsut. Right, circa the 18th dynasty. This is where we point to the archaeological research and evidence that matches closely to the biblical narrative and where if there was any time in the ancient, what we know of ancient Egyptian um, history or archaeology or chronology, it would have been the 18th dynasty, the Exodus, and the Hebrews and the Israelites in the time of Joseph, roughly the 12th dynasty. So the 12th dynasty, the Joseph time, and the 18th dynasty, the Exodus time. So here we say this corresponds with this right here in Exodus chapter 1 verse 10, where they said, come on, let us deal wisely with them. Lest they multiply and it come to pass that when they fall out any war, they join also to our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Now, this is interesting because here this verse will make you think that they was going to push right the Hebrews and the Israelites out of um, Egypt. Right. This verse right there. But then as it goes further, we see um, infanticide. Right, we see the killing, right, the genocide and the killing, right, of the Hebrew and the Israelite male children, right. We see um, an increase in the burdens of labor, right, and the Hebrews and the Israelites are relegated to the bottom of the labor force, right, and they are denied even a a religious or spiritual holiday to go outside, right, to the wilderness to worship and to come back and continue what they're doing. That's how we all began, right? Let my people go, free them up. They didn't want to free them up from the least. So we get to see that the incrementally things were getting worse with this new administration in ancient Egypt, right? And so here they say, come on, let us deal with them. Let, let us deal wisely, key word, wisely with them. Lest they, speaking of the Hebrews, right? And the people of the children of Israel, the people of the sons of Israel, the Hebrews. And the Hebrews are not just speaking about those who are just ethnically related, but those who are spiritually, we could say for lack of a better word, religiously, spiritually related. And this also includes certain Egyptians, as we can prove from the Exodus narrative. And it came to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also to our enemies and fight against us. Let's pause on the fact that this new Sutan Bet, Sutan Net, Sutan Bat, this new king, right, of ancient Egypt gives this proclamation, right? Was this Kamose, who they say drove out the Hyksos, the Hekshaus, or was it um, Ahmose, right, who some say it was the one who began this um, 
this new um, um, dynasty, right? That includes the uh, Amenhoteps and then later on would include the Tutmos, the Tutmoseses, leading up to Tutmosis the third, who we say is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. But they say here, they join also to our enemy. So this is not Tutmos right here. Tutmos comes at the end part because the Exodus has the beginning of this 18th dynasty, right? And up to the Tutmos the third, right? To the Exodus point, right? Of the narrative right here that we have in the second book of Moshe. So when they say, lest they join also for our enemies, the question here, who were the enemies, right? That the ancient Egyptians were concerned that the children of Israel and the people of the children of Israel, if there arose any war, might join with the enemies. Who? Who? Right? Who were these um, so-called enemies? The enemies, we're talking about the nine bowls, right? The nine bowls, the, the, the sea peoples, those are called the sea peoples. And this gives us a, a little bit of the a look of the sea peoples. And here the sea peoples seem to be a wide range of ethnicities, the different types. They're all not the same type. They're all not the same, like, you know, um, uh, Tanesi people or Nubians, so-called Negro types. They're not the same, just Asiatic. The, the combination of all these people, right? So in the Egyptian view, according to the archaeology, the Egyptians considered all of these, right? Let's come, come out of this, considered all these to be their enemies. Let's go over here. Here we go. Right, so the Nubian, right, the Nubian, the black type, right, clearly the African type, right, was their enemies. The Egyptians were the Egyptians anti Africans, right? Here, a so called Semitic type, right, a Semitic type, right? Even look at his features, you can see, you know, that Afro Asiaticness in his features right there with his locks, so forth and so on. So he's included, right? they were included together now remember what you're seeing is a zooming in of a cane it's a cane so he had these canes and had the enemies at the end of the cane the handle so like you know the handle like so when you hold the cane you actually are like holding the, the bent enemies you're bending as you walk you're bending the enemies right so there was a lot that went into the art here a lot of thought also some a lot of enmity they really dislike these people so here we can see even if you look at the features a little darker skin and complexion right you can see that this is a black man right this is a black man right a modern black man afro afro asiatic afro semitic these are black people we have people who look like this today people in parts of Africa, right, who look like this today, who can trace their lineage back many, many generations and have no white people, no European, right? And they have that sort of complexion, right? See, we have to get past this stereotype, right? This PTSD academically. There's a PTSD. Ac look at this cane. Can you see this cane right here? <laughs> you see this cane right here? That's the handle of the cane right there, right? That's also the handle of the cane right there, right? So the Egyptians, even right here, there we go, there we go. So you can see this a little better right here. We can zoom in on this, right? You can see them at the, at, at the handle of the cane. This, all this was found in King Tut's, and this is all part of the King Tut's uh, fine. Let's zoom in on this. You see them right there? So you can zoom in on it right there, and then even up there, this is what they have on display, right? And notice, even on display, Notice they have two Nubians, right? Two blacks, right? Notice that on display, I'm sure they have more than that. They probably have, but they just put one there and had the other people. If you look at it, remember those four out of nine were black skinned people, four out of nine, right? We went through that a little earlier, right? But they put on this, right, two blacks, right, on display because they're trying to put across the public even that, look, the ancient Egyptians wasn't these people. So the question is right here, were the ancient Egyptians these people? These people obviously were enemies of the ancient Egyptians. And yes, even a dark skinned black, black people were, you know what I mean? What do you think they did to these people? Huh? What do you think they did to these people? Huh? <laughs> Is that he tried to convert them to their Egyptian religion? Here we have 1336 to 1327, they say. 429, Pharaohs of Egypt, walking stick of Tutankhamun. Detail, Egyptian Museum, Cairo. Photo, Hans Allerman. 
2016, right? So it shows very clear. It's kind of interesting though, because either this 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 man right here is wearing gloves, right? You know something? Either he's wearing gloves, or even his features, right, are features of black people, black man. You could you could see it right there. But look at his hand down here. Why is his hand black too? Is he wearing gloves, right? This means that they've tampered with a lot of the archaeology, and and they have tampered with it. I mean, and they have suppressed it, right? Why isn't this not King Tut, right? <laughs> all right, King Tut. They even will make you believe that King Tut was not a black man. He did not look like that. If you look at some of their so-called recreations, right, of King Tut, right, like they say right here, right. You can see on this right here. This is where they. These are the real enemies of the Egyptology and Kemetics. Right, Tutankhamun was not black. This is Zahi Hawass. And the portrayal of ancient Egyptian civilization as black has no element of truth to it. This is what he says, has no element. And Zawi, Zahi Hawass, or whatever his name is, he can say such things like that because a lot of the real black archaeology is, is sealed up. You or me really can't get to it because you or me probably don't even know where they hid it. Right, can't even get to it. Right? He says, uh, Vigno deduced that Tutankhamun has a narrow nose, buck teeth, a receding chin, and Caucasian features to show the racism of these modern so-called Egyptians. Because they're part of the same thing that was part of the enemies of ancient Egypt, and this none of them were the Hebrews. I want to point that out. Right? None of them were the Hebrews, but they were, you could say, Hebrew-related peoples. They were people who were related to the Israelites. Right? Just like the Kushites were people related to the Egyptians, but then the Egyptians went against the Kushites when they felt like it. But they were related people. But here, they try to say this right here. This is from National Geographic 2005 because the black conscious movement from the 90s was getting so powerful and still is getting powerful, right, that they had to do this whole King Tut's face reconstructed, right, and then try to use the science, the pseudoscience. So Vigno deduced that Tutankhamun had a narrow nose, buck teeth, a receding chin, and Caucasian features. Such features are typical of European. R really? I'm going to show you some stuff where they actually said that black people had receding chins like a couple of hundred years ago when he first came up with this, this pseudoscience of like, you know, trying to say, well, black skulls are this and white skulls are that. They were saying that black people had receding chins. I remember that couple of say, I was like, what? Receding, really? You know, receding chins? I mean, some might have, but but, but it's, not, it's not generally like the, the main feature. But now here they're saying that there is buck teeth, narrow nose, buck teeth, a receding chin, and Caucasian features. Such features are typical of European. So see where they double down, they say Caucasian one place, it's a European, then they say North African, Middle Eastern, and Indian people. If there's not bigger racism than this right here, right? But this is like a desperate racism. This is where the discussion should be, right? Instead of about the Exodus, the Exodus is already summed up. Now, here some say, well, you see this man? So this man right here is not black. You put this man... Put this man in in New York City, in 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 uh, um, Atlanta, in Chicago, in Compton, anywhere. Put regular the regular clothes on people, you know, regular clothes on this person. Let them walk up and down, and think like people are not going to take this person as black. What are they going to take this person as? Even that whole point about Indian. Mm -hmm. The oldest archaeology in India, much of it. Some of the old black archaeology, the Indians actually, when they found it, the, Latin, the modern Indians, they sent it. So that's why you find a lot of the black, like Black Buddha and everything else, outside of India today, right? And what they did is, since these new people are over there, they just got busy on, on painting. You know, these people are very talented, very crafty. You know, they started to paint all this new stuff. And, and the new stuff, you can see they paint it clearly with light, white features and everything. Because if you know the history of India, you know that it was so-called Caucasian. You know, the whole thing about the Aryan and all that kind of stuff. That it was white peoples, right? Or light-skinned, barbarian white peoples that came. And, you know, they created this apartheid system and everything, so forth and so on. And modern India still is... Um, that's their PTSD, right? The whole untouchable thing, right? But you're saying this man here is not black? 
Are you saying that this man is not black or will not be considered black? Right there, right? Racial unity of the ancient Egyptians and Nubians. This is from ancient Egyptian archaeology. But this is not the sort of archaeology that they put on display in the Cairo Museum, right? Because why? Because they are in bed, right? They are in bed, right, with white supremacy, right? Look over here. This is a bunch of hands, right? This is a bunch of hands, right? A bunch of hands. You see right here? A bunch of hands, right? And I don't know if this is a gift or offering, but here's a bunch of hands, Right? This is to show that even when you start to look at the archaeology of ancient Egypt, you'll see where they had some very violent and brutal acts, Jabari. You know what I mean? Because some try to avoid this. Oh, this is all thieves, right? This is all thieves and everything. Uh huh. A little clearer picture of it in case you need to see a clearer picture. Whose hands are these? Right? Whose hands are these? You can see the scribe back here is taking notes. Right? He's taking notes of this as well. Right. So there's a lot of brutality that occurred. Right. In ancient times. Right. It was a part of the currency. Right. Of doing, as they say, doing business or being a ruler. Last point here is the shoes. Right. This is one. We saw a whole bunch of them before we have it. But sometimes we just have to sort through, you know, some of the exhibits. Because when we get to do a video, we say, let's do this video now. Only some exhibits are available at the present time. But this is a good one right here. This is actually the sandals. I think it's the bottom, the foot of the sandals of, of these shoes, right? And you can see on the foot of the sandal of these shoes that there are two images of the sea peoples right here, right? This is very interesting, right? So you have one that has this kind of sort of a Indo-European features and complexion, right? Indo-European. You have to remember that the white people, according to true archaeology, right, come out of the Black Sea. Also, the genetics point that, right? So actually, the white people are from Ham. White people come from Ham. So this makes it very interesting. So see, the curse of Ham, right, is really, the so-called curse of Ham is really white people. But there's no curse of Ham in the Bible. But since they started talking about the curse of Ham instead of the curse of Canaan, the cover up is worse than the lie. But you notice that these peoples even right here are working side by side with the stereotypical. Notice that picture right there of the so-called Nubian. That reminds me of the same kind of pictures that white people did, right? The same kind of caricature, right? That white people made of black people, isn't it? Ain't it? In it? In it? In it? In it the same? It is basically one and the same right there. That is amazing, right? So here, 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 breaking down the sea peoples right here, the different, the different peoples who were the enemies, black or white, right? It did not really matter to them. All these people were the enemies, but none of these directly are the Hebrew people, but they are peoples, right, who are in relation, like we have like the Edomites, the Edomites and the Canaanites, right? And we also have some Nubians or Kushites also, Right, who are, you know, so we can see some of the features are black people's features, right? Clearly. So when we just read Zawi Hawass, right, some of these people even became nationalized, right? As we get to see and study Egyptian artifacts right here. Now, here is also a pair of sandals, and you can see who's on the sandals right here. Notice who's on the sandals. Right? We have the Nubians on the sandals. So basically, you put your foot there, and when you're walking, you're walking on black people. Right? Here we go right here. The king walks on Egypt's racial enemies. Yet another candid racial image from Tutankhamun's tomb is found in a pair of his sandals, inlaid with a picture of a Semite, and a black. Notice the Semite capital S, the black is lowercase b. It didn't, they didn't even say a Semite and a Hamite, as the Egyptians were Hamito Semitic peoples themselves. Their language proves that. But you see how they even have the black lowercase. The fowl would trample his enemies underfoot when he walked. Interesting, a new, a new way of saying, like, you know, walking on your enemies, putting your enemies underfoot. All right? Mind you, if that's a Psalm, was it Psalm 60? It's Psalm 60, 57, 60, uh, Psalm 108, you know, over, you know, over what, what, over Edom, right? I will cast my shoe. <laughs> Remember that? Over Edom, I will cast my shoe, 
right? So we really need to look at the ethnic identities, right? What are the ethnic identities, right? And when we recognize the ethnic identities, there are many identities, ethnic identities that are clearly black. And we even see the ancient Egyptians, you know, fighting and killing black people, right? You know, people who are black. Here we go again. Tut's, King Tut's sandal. Blacks, lowercase, they like to do that. Blacks, they don't even say Africans, but they say blacks. You notice that? Why do you say Africans? You're talking about Africans and Asians were depicted, Afro-Asiatic, get it? Were depicted on his sandal as a form of humiliation, right? This is a little clearer picture, as a form of humiliation. It's interesting because the black, the Nubian is painted as black, and the Semite, you can see clearly the Semite right here has the Hebrew, we could say the Israelite, you know, that type right there, right? So we see over here, right? This is what they want to make people believe, so forth and so on, right here, right? Um, Spike TVs, Akhenaten, right? Versus the real, more authentic pictures. See, this is what we see authentically. Right, Tut's grandfather, Amenhotep the third. You can see his features right there. You can see her features right there. Right? You can see over here. Tut's grandmother, Queen T. Right? And then here is what they'd like to tell us. This is what they really look like. Right? It's such the it's like delusional racism. Right? The racism is just, just totally delusional. These people are delusional. Right? To say that this this is this. Right? This is not this. Right, but here, once again, the sandals of King Tut. Right? So we're going to pick up the controversy and say, were the ancient Egyptians, were they anti-African? Because that's the view that modern Egyptology is given, and then also showing some of these evidences here that makes us all have to re-examine what's being said right here. Right? So anyway, brothers and sisters, and we have pictures like this as well. Right? So they were like, equal opportunity the ancient egyptians were equal opportunity if you went against them they went against you right and this is the same thing for the hebrews and the israelites right the egyptians of this time period was going against us and our god our divine power went against them and thus we have the exodus nothing against the egyptians because they happened to be black or they happened to be egyptians even it was because of the downpression Right, the oppression. Here you see the flower running over, right? Black people, right? He's running them over with a chariot, right? And to think that the chariot was a, some say, an invention that the Syrians, right, and the Hittites had the chariot. And at first they were beating the Egyptian, and the Egyptian had to upgrade and adapt a better chariot, right? And once they did, we come up to the period of Tutmos the third. When Tutmos III, he's like, they say, the Napoleon of ancient Egypt, but he's a great conqueror. It's because of the upgrade in technology and technology that they had to re-engineer, reverse engineer from the Hittites and from others that were beating them on the battlefield. You know what I'm saying? But once they got up on the technology, you know, from the, from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, it was a whole different story. But look who they're, look who they're attacking here. These are black people. Right? These are black people, dark-skinned black people. We can say the Negroid type. Right? You want to see the little clearer? How about this one right here? Right? You see them running over them. Right? You see them running over these types right here. Right? This is how this is how they did it. Right? But then you also see them going over lighter skinned Libyan and Canaanitish types. Right? So this is just the the way it was, right? It's just the way it be. Right. You know, we're talking about power move. We're talking about empires. We're talking about kingdoms. You know what I mean? We're talking about kingdoms. We're not even talking about race in the sense that we have racialism of today. Right. This is a total different something. Right. Total different something right here. Let's see. OK, let's show you this one right here. Does this make it clear? Now, notice why they're running over these black Nehesia, right, Nehesi people. You'll notice over here they have some of the same people or similar people who are working with them. Notice some of the same people are behind the fire here on the chariot and some of the same ones getting run over by the chariot who are black people. 
So if we don't look at this honestly in a proper view, then whenever you talk about uh, Egypt was black, then the racist can throw these pictures up. And because you're not dealing with the real context, the reality of ancient history, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you basically uh, continue to lose the argument, right? Especially with those who look at these obvious pictures and say, hmm, it does look like these are black people, right? It does look like these are black people. The fact of the matter is that both of them are black people. The Egyptians, as well as the Nubians, as well as the Hebrews and Israelites, both of them are black people. Even many of the so-called um, uh, Asiatic peoples, right, are black peoples, right? So it wasn't about race as we have race today. But it's easy for the white racists and the white so-called supremacists to use these and utilize these right here because most ones are still on an emotional instead of an objective. You're looking at it from a subjective. Many of the comedic scholars are looking at this from a subjective. Even some of us as Hebrews be looking at it from a subjective perspective. We need to look at it from an objective perspective. So get off that subjective. When you look at it objectively, look behind the file right here. He has, he has the, the blacks, the browns, and the reds. The blacks, the browns, and the red carrying his banners. And he has his dogs and everything eating them up. And his chariot and horse running them over. Right? This is just the reality of it. Right? So were the Egyptians anti-Africans? An argument could be made. Right? When we start to really look at the pictures, an argument could be made right, about that. As you look at these pictures here, cannot an argument be made? Right? Look at this. What's this Egyptian soldier here with the locks? You see the Egyptian soldier, the brown skin right there with the locks? Right? The stabbing, the darker brown skin right there. How about this one right here? He is taking a, a um, what is that? That's, that's the netta. Right? He's cutting him, chopping him down. You see them falling right here on the battlefield. Isn't this clear to you? Right? That we can make a racial thing out of this, but that is just regurgitating white supremacist thought. Or we can look at it in reality and saying that, yeah, this happens. So not getting caught up on the colorism, right? Recognizing the colorism. You know, recognizing the colors, but not getting this is King Tut right here. This is in King Tut's tomb. Notice this right here. He this is Tut right here. My big conqueror, and he is like basically expressing the Egyptian, you could say the political sentiment of Egypt. We have claws and paws on you, whether you are black, whether you are Nubian, right? Whether you are Hamitic, whether you are Cushitic. See, they like to say black with a lowercase b instead of saying African. They like to say black with a lowercase b instead of saying Cushitic. Because once you see it like that, you have to say, oh, hold on for a moment. These Egyptians were all about themselves, regardless of whoever, who, whatever you thought you were. If you came against them, you came against them. Now, as conquerors and rulers, you got to kind of respect that, you know, just as a basic fact, you know, just as we are seeking to defend the fact of the narrative and the scripts, but also defend it objectively and even show this proof right here. It's obviously an important point to say that they were going against the, the Nubian, right? the Nubian, the Hamitic, the Cushitic, and the so-called Asiatic, the so-called Shemitic. They were basically going against the Afro-Asiatic, the Afro-Semitic. What's interesting is that ancient Egyptian language and linguistic and as a culture is also Afro-Shemitic. So they are an Afro-Shemitic, you could say superpower. Ancient Egypt was an Afro-Shemitic superpower that was going against others Right? That wasn't superpowers, but were coming up, up against them as a superpower. And they basically showed how they would have dealt with it and how they did deal with it, as you can see from this right here. Right? Or we can look at this right here. Right? And we can zoom in and we can study the action. This is the aspect of um, Egyptology that many of the pro-blacks right, don't want to really address. There's very little difference in the complexion between these, these right here. But it's not about complexion, right? It's not about the complexion, right? So here, let's sum this up right here, here, here. Like, share, subscribe. Is ancient was ancient Egypt was a was a biblical biblical Exodus anti-African, right? Or was it anti-oppression, right? It was anti-black oppression. 
We say it was anti-black oppression. It was anti-oppression, whether black or white, non-partial, just keeping it very non-partial, all right? Or was it aliens? Was it aliens? I'm not going to get off on that alien, the alien trip right there. But here, 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 just to sum it up right here, all of them was to come under, notice this right here, this is the Pharaoh's foot right here. Notice who's at the bottom of the Pharaoh's foot. Isn't that a black man right there? So this is to say that, oh, they were against black people. But then by saying that, it's to say that they were not black people. See, why a lot of the white scholars and even Hawass and the rest of them? Because they don't know of a world in which we ruled. So on both sides of it, in some cases, you'll see this black power against another black power, this black people against another black people, right? We have to look at, well, what were the reasons? You know, that's what we have to look at to be objective. What were the reasons behind the exodus? Right? And based on the Hebrew reason behind the Exodus, is it possible that the ancient Egyptians could have done what the Exodus, you know, um, alleges they have done? Is it possible based on the available art and evidence? And we say it's not just possible, right? It is likely and it was what occurred. So shalom, chabarim, shalom. We we'll get ready for the podcast, Rastafari Israelites, the, the evening podcast, 10 p.m. And forward, forward, forward. Like, share, and subscribe. Shalom, chabarim, shalom. This is Yadin. It's Ras Ayadonis, Tafari, L-O-J, the line of Judah Society, L-O-J-S dot O-R-G.